and that's how Long Grain began. And um, it was a big restaurant. We opened that restaurant on the 27th of August 1999, and we did, it was my 30th birthday, and we did 105 people on the first night. And then we never did less than 100, I don't think, the whole time I was there, and I was there for 13 years. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. After detailing the trauma of losing all business and the changes he needed to implement to survive in part one, Marty Boats reflects on his career and what the future may hold. I think I've listened to a lot of the podcasts and um, most boys and girls say, you know, they didn't... They, just didn't want to continue on in school and I was one of those people I was naughty I was really naughty at um in grade in grade 10 and I was asked not to come back to the school that I went to in Brisbane um and but I did want to I, I did my work experience that in, in year 10 in um in a hotel in in the city and I and my mum worked there in reception and she um, was friends with the head chef and he obviously knew me from doing the two weeks work experience there during the year and and he offered me a position as a kitchen hand so when my when Christmas holidays finished um, I started I started an apprenticeship as a yeah as a chef or well I started as a kitchen hand with white overalls on 15 years old not that great <laughs> But um, I got through that first year and, and, um, and then I moved from the hotel into a very small restaurant in, in Brisbane in Paddington called Faces and um, it was, it was um, voted the best BYO in Queensland for quite a few years running while I was there, um, not because I was well, definitely not the head chef, I was just an apprentice and, um, and I was really proud to work there but it was really hard. There was only three of us in the kitchen and we worked, I probably worked 80 hours a week. And, um, but we produced good food and it was, it was a good environment, well, it was a good environment to learn and, um, and I stuck it out until the, until the, the end. And then I, um, I went back to, I went to Europe and lived with my dad in Germany for a few years and um, lived in London for a little while in between there as well because I got called into the army by registering being back in Germany because I'm a German wow. citizen still um, and conscription was still happening there so I was 19 and I was working in Stuttgart in a little restaurant and my dad rang me and said you just be conscripted you've got to go to the army and I said, I'm not. <laughs> I, said I can't go to the army I'm me no way I mean I could go now like if I had to go to the army now I'd do it but <laughs> but you know I'm a lot older now and um you know probably enjoy all those boys around me but I would have enjoyed it then but I was very scared very scared and um so I packed up my little yellow golf and and we I was in Frankfurt where my with my dad and I said I'm gonna I'm going to drive to London and I drove to London and um, I had some friends living there and I went and lived with them for a year and got out of the draft. I said, Dad said that I, just, that I went back to Australia and um, so I went and lived in London and worked as a waiter over there. I didn't want to go into the kitchen because I wanted to have some fun, which I did. So that was that story and then after, the, after that I, went, I came back to Australia. How did you end up uh, in Long Grain? Um, I... After a while, I moved to Sydney when I was 20 and I, or oh, 21, and I had a little cafe in Oxford Street with a mate of mine, Terry, and um, did that for a few years. And then I worked at Zigalini's at, oh, actually before then I worked at Zigalini's at Double Bay and I'm, I, I had a really good friend there, Katrina, and, um, and I said, I really want to go to this restaurant called um, Darley Street Thai and um which was in Newtown and so I went with her and we um we went there again after that um and I met David Thompson through one of the waiters there Martin he said he knew that we were chefs because we were so interested in what was what we were eating and I'd never tasted anything like that first mouthful of 
betta leaf with prawn and caramelized coconut and pomelo and lime leaves and lemongrass and all those flavors that I've never ever really tasted before and I was so impressed and I really thought to myself I really want to learn learn this because I just love the whole concept of sharing and and all the flavors and stuff anyway so David Thompson came out met him um, I wrote him a letter the next day say, saying thank you so much for coming out um, and speaking to us if there's any chance of me being able to do work experience in your kitchen I'd really like that so we he rang I left my phone number on the letter and he rang me and uh, said you can start next Monday so I worked on my days off um, at Darley Street um, on Mondays and Ross Losted was there at the time and Michael Vermar, David King it was a pretty full-on kitchen to go into as a you know I was I was I mean, I'd done an apprenticeship but I was green like I did not I couldn't julienne very well. Um, my knives weren't as sharp as they need to be to cook Thai, or, you know, to do all the prep for Thai food. David Thompson was pretty full on at that time. He's full on, but he was really full on then because it was, you know, he'd just moved into Daly Street Thai in, in King's Cross. So it was, it was full on and we were busy all the time. And um, I... I really struggled at the beginning. Like the first six months was really hard. And I remember, <laughs> I was, <laughs> anyway, just ha- the whole vision coming back to me. I was doing, um, I was doing um, pot food or um, curries with David King and I had to strain this car- um, palm sugar caramel sauce for, the, for whatever it was for. Um, I think it was sweet fish sauce to go over deep fried fish. Anyway, I... Something, somebody bumped me and I and the hot sugar went over my hand and um, so I burnt my hand quite badly and then um, a waiter wrapped it up for me because I had to do service, like there was no going home. So I just wrapped it up, did the service. During the service, I also had to deep fry <clears throat> beetle leaves that were dipped in a, um, in a batter to go with a numb prick. So you had to dip them in this batter, stick them in the fucking wok with, you know, the hot wok, obviously. And um, I don't know, I didn't do that. The mixture wasn't quite right. And every time I put the, um, every time I put the beetle leaves into the hot oil, it had just spit everywhere. The oil would spit everywhere. And it went, this one time it just spat really a, quite a lot and it went in my face, like, and I, <laughs> so I was just screamed out fuck you know I was like oh, God, this cannot be happening and you know the boys are just standing there laughing at me you know the queen in the corner that she can't fucking handle it handle the section anyway I got through the service and after that I have to say that um the respect was there so I sort of I finally got got in with them but it, it took quite a long time and they knew I was there for the long the long haul and I got through it and um and I improved obviously <laughs> So yeah, I I I finished there. Sorry, I I I was at Darley Street for I think for about a year, and then I went and worked in in um, Italy because Sean Sean Moran had um, put an ad in the paper saying there's a job going. You have to have a European passport in Tuscany, and we need you for the summer. Or you know, it's for the summer season, so you leave sort of around Easter and come and then until November and I applied for it and I got the job and I was a bit I sort of didn't want to leave Darley Street but I really wanted to do this I really wanted to travel I'd never been to Italy before and um, so I did that for a year but David was really gracious and he said to me look when you come back you you know your job's here for you and that's great because um, he said "I, I, I encourage you to go and learn I want you to go and do this. This is really good for you. So um, he was very nice about that. Um, so off I went and did that and learned a lot. Came back to Sydney after I'd finished. Um, went back to Darley Street. And then David was talking about opening Sailor's Tie in, I think it was 95. And, um, oh, look, I mean, I was still green. Like, you know, I was. And anyway, he had this dude... Um, hooked up for the head chef's job and um and we all went to the taxi club one night and got quite pissed and um so David me Paul you know a few other guys we were at the taxi club 
this is like three o'clock in the morning, ridiculous, and um, drinking Maui, and David was very excited for, you know, because we were, he was going to open this new restaurant and everything was going so well, and, and I was having a chat to him, and I said, you know what, I think I could be the head chef down there. Um, <laughs> and he said, really? And I said, yeah, I think I could. I think I could handle it. And, um, and he said, okay, you've got the job then. Wow. So the next, the next day, I didn't think of anything. We were all blind, right? And I, you know, I, I rolled down the hill because I just didn't live very far away from the taxi club. And um, went to work the next day. Got to work at one o'clock, as I always do, um, early. And, um, and David King said, you're mad. And I said, why? He said, you can't be the head chef. And I went, what do you mean? And he said, Thompson just told me that you're gonna, you, you said you want to be the head chef of sailors and he's going to give you the job. And I said, yeah, we did talk about that last night. That's right. And, um, and anyway, so, but I, I had to prove David King wrong. So I did it and, and I, yeah, and, you know, opened that restaurant. I'd never run a, run a kitchen before. I was 25. I had Thai girls upstairs doing the noodle bar, which I that was a really a big head fuck for me, t- trying to talk to these Thai girls and make sure that they listened to me. Um, anyway, it, it all worked out because we sort of opened up, up there first and I got in with them and they liked me, so they did anything for me. And then I went downstairs and and we opened the main restaurant downstairs, which was a beautiful, beautiful room designed by Belly Kate and Halliday at the time. And um, and yeah, everyone came and and we got a good review and um, and yeah, continued there for you know I was there for about a year or two years and um, yeah, I just um, loved it, L- loved that restaurant. And um, Alex Herbert was working with me some t- part time. And then she was off to um, to do another do her own restaurant, Bird Cowfish in Balmain, and I went and joined her for um, the first year of that the life of that restaurant as a co chef um, in her kitchen, um, which I enjoyed. And um, but then I, you know, she it was her restaurant, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back to cooking Asian food. So we went back. I went back. Sorry to. Um, to Dali Street, and my job in the kitchen and the, at Sailors was taken. So, I then did Dali Street Thai Tuck Shop next door in a little cafe called Box, which was like a little cafe next, right next to Dali Street Thai. So basically, I was in there. I went into the kitchen early in the morning. I did all the food, boxed it all up for takeaway, took it all over into Box, and then I um, sold that at night time. And I did that for about a year and a half. I'm just trying to race through, and then and so did that, and then during that time I did some catering gigs through Darley Street, and um, a beautiful friend of mine who's not here anymore, Martin Cook. I did a um, I did a lunch for he and a client in um, Wallara, and he was really impressed with the food that I I was cooking, and he said, "Oh, I've got a gig for you if you're interested in New York. Um, friends of m- mine want need a private chef, um, and." on their property in Southampton, would you be interested? So I did that. Um, and so I left Darley Street again. Um, David wasn't happy with me this time. And um, I went off and um, went over to to um, New York and worked for this couple for about a year. And then I came back and um, worked at... Um, um, I worked at the Jersey Cow in Wallara as a waiter, and I did a hort- I was trying to do a horticultural course at the time at TAFE, which didn't really work well for me because I didn't know how to use a computer. So I dropped out of there, and in that time met Sam, who I'd worked with years before at Zigalini's at Double Bay. And um, anyway, he said he was opening a restaurant with a mate of his, Rob, and would I be interested in helping them design a kitchen and just talk about, you know, what their concept was or and um, and that's how I got sort of into involved with that and um, I then sort of said I think I do Asian food in this space it's it's just such a big space you need to do shared food and I think Rob's concept was doing a mishmash of Japanese Italian everything I said look that's not my forte I think I just do all Asian food shared and that's what 
um, that's what I propose. And I did them some food and they really enjoyed it. And then they said, why don't you become the head chef and we'll, let's open this restaurant all together. And that's how Long Grain began. And um, it was a big restaurant. We opened that rest restaurant on the 29th, oh, sorry, the 27th of August, 1999. And we did, it was my 30th birthday and we did 105 people on the first night. And then we never did less than 100, I don't think, the whole time I was there. And I was there for 13 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm. What's your fondest memory of that restaurant? Oh, oh, we had fun. It was fun. Like, you know, being able to see everyone when they came in the front door and, and having lots of people around and... And the cocktails and, you know, we'd never, you know, I'd never seen a stick drink before and um, the amount of limes and fresh fruit that we went through just in those stick drinks and um, met a lot of really lovely people and a lot of friendships were forged on those tables and in the kitchen and um, it was a good place to work. I really loved that and then replicating it in Melbourne was, <laughs> that was a chore. Um, Melbourne was a different, was like having, you know, child number two and child number two has got a totally different personality to child number one. And, um, and so that was, that was a hard, um, that was hard to, I didn't, I had to go and have some self help there because I, I'm, I, well, I still am a control freak and I, it just wasn't running as, as the other one did. And, um, but I finally got it together and, and it started you know, and it was, it smoothed itself out. And so I'd worked half the week in Sydney and half the week in Melbourne for seven years from 2005 to 2013. Well, it's a long way from where you are now with uh, Cook's Co-op. Um, but how are you feeling about the future? And, and is there any positives to come out of this traumatic year that you've had so far? Yeah, I think, as I said, I, I believe that people will want to go and be out in the country or I want to try and I want to offer somewhere where people can go and relax and feel and just feel calm. And that's sort of how I'm trying to make it work for me because we're not going to be able to do large events. So I just want to do the sort of offer the produce boxes, offer you know, just go for a walk around, go and have a look at the river, go and sit down in, under a tree um, and and come and eat food here and, and just enjoy it. Come and share this experience with me um, when you can. And sort of, the, I think that's the only thing, that's what's sort of keeping me going at the moment because I know that there's, I can offer something really good. I I just need the team to back me up, which I've got. Um, I'm looking for a chef at the moment, so if anyone out there that wants to have a tree change, please contact me. Um, and so I thought I'd just throw that in because that would be good. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, it's it's special. It's a special place, and I think that it's worth sharing with people, and we, and we, need, and we will need it because if people can't travel, um, this is escapism, and I want to tr create an escapism like I think long grain was an escapism for people as well. Um, they walked into the door and it was a buzzing world and you could go to the bar and you could go to, you know, and eat and then you could go back to the bar and have another drink. And I remember when we first opened there, you know, you could still smoke in restaurants and the bar was very smoky and the DJ was playing and it was, it was, it was fun, you know, and, and, and we need to have fun. We need to have a laugh. Everything's so serious. Well, I think, um, uh... I think what you're offering up there will be a real uh, lure for a lot of people uh, to get in their cars and, um, and as you say, they need to get out and uh, it is quite special, the area that you're in. I, um, it's been amazing to hear your story. It's, it's, it's extraordinary um, what you've been through this year, but um, the fight that you've shown is also extraordinary. Um, we're honoured to have you on Deep in the Weeds, mate. Keep in touch. Can't do it without a good team. Yeah. Can't do it without a good team, and this, even though it's small, but it's very good. And I thank my team from the bottom of my heart because, um, yeah, it's um, it's been it's been a challenge. Well, mate, take care, and um, we'll talk again soon. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.